This is Arlen Salty, the co-director and co-founder of Breakforth Ministries. Before we jump into this episode, my wife Elsa and I warmly invite you to head over to BreakforthMinistries.com where you can find out about our live events, our tours to the Holy Lands, resources, and so much more. Again, that's BreakforthMinistries.com. You'll also be able to see more information on our teachers as well as links to their resources in case you'd like to dive in just a little bit deeper. Okay. Let's get right to today's episode. This session is by Sean McDowell, and it's called Equipping Youth with a Biblical Worldview. Let me tell you a little bit about Sean. Audiences worldwide have appreciated Sean's candor and his compelling stories as he challenges youth and adults to deepen their Christian walk. His books, Evidence for the Resurrection and More Than a Carpenter, along with his father, Josh McDowell, and many others have been lauded for the brilliant presentation of apologetics. He really encourages us all to know what we believe. Let me tell you a little bit about this session, equipping youth with a biblical worldview. Youth who have a biblical worldview are less likely to engage in risky behavior and more likely to have a positive impact on their generation for Christ. In this session, we're gonna learn the nature of a biblical worldview why it's important, and some practical steps to help young people develop a biblical worldview. Here's Sean McDowell. I want to draw your attention as we begin with a passage that has intrigued me. It's in the book of Judges. And in Judges chapter 2, it's the beginning of Judges, and it's talking about the generation of Joshua and how the generation of Joshua who led the people into the promised land which had been promised to Abraham 400 years earlier. It said they settled in the land and they followed the Lord throughout their entire life. But in Judges chapter 2, verse 10, it says, all that generation was gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them that did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. Then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers. You see what happened? Here's a generation that followed and loved the Lord. They saw his works firsthand. But then another generation rose up that did not know the Lord. And they walked away from him. And I was reading that passage. I stopped and I, it caught my attention. I thought, well, what happened? Why as parents, why as teachers, why as youth pastors, why as adults did they fail to raise up a generation who knew and loved the Lord? And as a teacher... And as a parent, I ask my, myself that every day. What can we do to raise up a generation and pass on our values to a younger generation of people coming up? Well, the reason this story is so pertinent is because studies are shown, and now with, with communication in Western culture, what's happening in the U.S. is happening from pastors and youth pastors I talk to on a larger scale as well, is that this in many ways mirrors the generation of young people we have growing up. We have a generation of people who know and love the Lord, and there's another generation raising up who is affected profoundly by our secular culture and are falling and walking away from their Lord. In fact, I've chronicled tons of studies on this. And the best I can show that I've come to the conclusion is that between 58 and 88% of young people, when are seniors in high school, and this is from North America, seniors in high school who follow the Lord by the time they've been in the university will have walked away from their faith. Isn't that sad? And the question is why? Well, I believe, I'll be honest with you, there are many factors involved in why a young person will walk away. Today I want to focus on one of them in particular. One of my favorite radio show hosts is a man named Dennis Prager. He's Jewish. And he was having a, he noticed something really interesting. That married couples who experience the sudden tragic loss of a child, he said a majority of them were likely to get divorced, or at least separated. And he thought, why? Why would this happen, and how can I prevent it? So he started bringing people on his show, and he started doing research, and he wrote a book aptly titled, Happiness is a Serious Problem. And he said there, I think I found the difference. He said the difference between couples who go through tragedy and it splits them apart, and those who go through tragedy and stay together, is those who have a philosophy of life that can make sense of the tragedy 
of the sudden loss of a child. In other words, those whose worldview, as painful as it is, can help them process this tragedy, are far more likely to withstand the pressure and the pain that they go through. Why are so many young people walking away from the faith? I think one of the biggest reasons is because we haven't trained a generation of young people before they step out from our homes and our churches into our secular culture and on the college campus. So they're challenged from a professor, they're challenged from temptation, and are not prepared for those challenges that come, and many of them will walk away from their faith. I was at UC Berkeley, which is probably, almost for sure, the most liberal university in our country, and I was speaking with a pastor there, and they have a, a ministry of about 600 students, and I said, what happens when you see these freshman Christians come on campus? He said, you wouldn't believe it, Sean. He goes, as soon as a professor, because in the eyes of so many young people, just the fact that somebody is a professor, they carry a sense of authority about them. When a professor either directly attacks the scriptures, which we're going to talk about after lunch, or directly attacks creation by God or the historical Jesus, or even just subtly undermines it, he says it rocks these young people's world, and many of them never recover. I'm convinced one of the reasons that so many young people are walking away is that we're training young people to love God with their hearts and with their souls, but not to love God with their minds. In my country, there was a tragedy about three years ago. So you probably heard about it in, in Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania, where this man walked into an Amish community. It was in October 2006. He took all the boys, put them outside, took young girls, I think about 10 of them aged about 5 or 6 to 13, and he killed them execution style. And it came out in the news. I have a friend who lives in that community, and I talked to him. And, you know, he said, all these people are calling in asking questions about the tragedy. I said, well, what's the top question? He says, you know what the top question is? He said, the top question is, how can a people such as the Amish so quickly forgive somebody such as this man for such a grievous act that he committed? Now, why did he? In fact, at his funeral, there was about 75 people there. Over half of them were Amish. Isn't that incredible? You know why? Because the Amish believe in the sovereignty of God. So when a challenge like that comes, it's as painful for them as anybody else, but they can process and make sense of it, and they're equipped to deal with that tragedy. So many young people, I think, are chucking their faith because we haven't raised them up to know what they believe and why they believe it and have convictions that certain things are true. Look, there was a study, the largest study I've seen of spiritual young people, and it was, it was on a study of youth and religion. And in there, they asked religious students who had walked away from their faith. They said, why did you leave? And you know what the number one response was? The number one response was intellectual skepticism. They said, there are too many questions that can't be answered. They said, historically, there's no evidence. Scientifically, there's no proof. And that broke my heart because I think there's incredible proof for Christianity. 32% said that. That's why David Kinneman, president of the Barna Research now, he wrote a book called Unchristian. And if you want to read a book that's sobering about how outsiders tend to view Christians, this was an eye opening book, how they tend to think about us as believers. And he said this he said, We are learning that one of the primary reasons that ministry to teenagers fails to produce a lasting faith is because they're not being taught to think. Isn't that true? It maybe doesn't last because they're not being taught to think. Now let me define something for you because we're going to be talking about this a lot today. What is a worldview? What do we mean when we say worldview? Let me give you a little definition here. And this one's kind of tough, but I think you guys can get it. It's a view of the world. <laughs> now I know that's kind of obvious. What do we mean by a worldview? A worldview in a sense, it's a philosophy about life. A worldview is what answers the basic questions. Who am I? Why am I here? Is there a purpose of life? What is the nature of man? Does God exist? Now, everybody has a worldview. It's impossible not to have a worldview or philosophy of life. Now, everyone has a worldview, but everybody doesn't know that they have a worldview. And our choices that we make every single day are based upon our worldview. So think about it this way. It's like a mental map of reality. I was in... (laughs) If any of you been to Kansas, I'm curious. How many of you here have actually been to Kansas? I was in a little town called McPherson, which is in the middle of nowhere. Actually, 
All of Kansas is in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so it doesn't even matter. And I woke up in the middle of the night. When I sleep, I put, maybe some of you do this. I put a towel under my door so it's like pitch black. I want it just as dark as possible. Well, I woke up in the middle of the night. And have you ever had this where you wake up and you think, where am I? You ever had that moment? Now, hopefully you haven't had the thought where you wake up and you go, who am I? <laughs> then you know it's going south fast. Well, I woke up, I thought, where am I? And I couldn't remember where I was. So I reached over and I'm like, okay, my wife's not there. I'm not at home. I got up and it was so dark I couldn't see. So I was tracing around the sides of the whole hotel room, knocked over a lamp and broke it. But don't worry, I, I switched it with the neighbors before I had to pay for it. <laughs> that is a joke. <laughs> I got a mean letter one time. That's a joke, all right? It was from Pastor Rick. No, I'm just kidding. And why was I lost? I had no mental map of the way the room worked, so I was lost. Look, the lights go on at my house. I could get blindfolded to my kids, to the bathroom, to the kitchen, to the front door. Because my mental map matches up with reality. A worldview is like a mental map of reality. And it shapes how all of us live and the choices that we make every single day. All of us have a worldview. One of my professors put it this way when I was in grad school. He said, this is why truth is so powerful. It allows us to cooperate with reality, whether spiritual or physical, and tap into its power. As we learn to think correctly about God, specific scriptural teachings, the soul, or other important aspects of a Christian worldview, we are placed in touch with God and with those realities. And we thereby gain access to the power available to us to live in the kingdom of God. That's a power of a worldview. In fact, think about it this way. You know where the word university comes from? University comes from unity in diversity. The whole point of a university is that you would, you would learn math, science, history, philosophy, and they're all, the first ones were all started by Christians. All the different disciplines from a unity, from a Christian perspective. That's what a worldview is. Thinking about all of life from a biblical perspective. Now let me show you, I'm going to give you a little test. I'm, I'm a teacher, so I just can't go anywhere without quizzing people. It's in my blood. I want to write some stats up here. On the largest study of spirit of teens today who consider themselves conservative Protestants, pretty much evangelicals. And I want you to write down first how, what you think kids would say to these questions. All right, so here we go. We'll do six of them. And there should be, did I give them on your hand? I don't remember if you had a hand out or not. But here we go. What percentage of conservative Protestant young people would say that God created the world but is not involved today anymore? This is called deism. In other words, it's like God wound up the universe like a clock, and then he left it and distanced himself from it. So just take a stab at it. What would you say conservative, Protestant, evangelical students, say 13 to 19 years old, would answer to that question? Honestly, just put down what you think or make a mental note. How about number two? Believe God is impersonal like a cosmic force. Now this is the Oprah Winfrey avatar view of God. That God is like an electrical current that pervades all the universe, and we tap into this power. What percentage of conservative Protestant youth say they believe in the Christian God, but really hold that view of God? Take a stab at it. Number three, maybe or definitely believe in reincarnation. Four, are not sure of the existence of miracles. Yeah, I'm not really sure miracles happened in the past or can still happen today. I I'm skeptical. All right, number five, watch The Simpsons. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That was just random. Are not assured of the existence of evil spirits. Not really sure demons or Satan is really real. And number six, believe many religions may be true. Let's see how you did. I'll go slow. The sponsor of this conference said, yeah, we don't get the brightest people here, so I'll go. I'm just kidding. You can tell I teach high school, right? You take yourself too seriously, you don't survive. So we're just having fun. Believe God created the world but is not involved today. 10%. One in 10. Now believe God is impersonal like a cosmic force, 8%. Now if you're sitting there thinking, well, 10, 8, that's not very high. Realize the answers in this were, were exhaustive. They were exclusive. So that means 10 and 8% is almost one out of five of conservative Protestant Christian young people do not believe that God is a personal being who can really relate to their lives. 
Think about the implications of that. Why pray to God for strength through temptation if you don't believe God is a personal being who answers prayers? Why pray to God for strength when you're suffering if you don't think God is really there and listens to our prayers? You see, ideas have consequences. How about this one? Believe, uh, maybe you're definitely believing in reincarnation. 33%. One in three. Now think how differently you might live. Think about it. If you believe you might die and get another shot at it and multiple shots at it to get it right. In fact, in Buddhism, Buddhism they believe in the cycle of samsara. You might have millions of lives versus one life where you hold to account for every thought and action before a holy and loving God. How can you live in the power of the resurrection like Paul says in Philippians 3 if you're not convinced that the resurrection is a one-time event in history? Ideas have consequences. Are not sure of the existence of miracles? 23%. One in four. For some religions, that wouldn't matter, but Christianity is based upon a historical miracle, namely the resurrection of Jesus. Are not assured of the existence of evil spirits? 42%. Just think about that. What does Peter compare Satan to? A what? A roaring lion intent upon devouring his prey. Now, if young people or any of us don't believe that Satan is real, then how can we follow Peter's advice, which is to resist the devil? Ideas have consequences. Believe many religions may be true. I I saw one recent Pew Research poll that said 70% of Americans, 70% of Americans in our country believe that there's more than one way to get to God. And they said this isn't just an American phenomenon. They said this seems to be a, a Western phenomenon about multiple ways to get to God. What about young people? 48% of conservative Protestant young people. So, well, the famous country singer Willie Nelson, he said, I believe in what Kinky Friedman said, which is may the God of your choice bless you. Almost half of our conservative, of our kids would be inclined to agree with that. Now, why does this really matter? Why don't we take a minute to really examine the beliefs of young people? Who cares? Why don't we just teach them to love God with their hearts and be passionate about Jesus? You know why it matters? Because studies show that people who call themselves born-again Christians, statistically speaking, live no differently than those who do not. Those who say, I'm a born-again Christian, whether cheating on their taxes, cheating on their spouse, harming somebody, lying, looking at pornography on the internet, whatever, they live no differently than those who say they do not. But you know what's interesting? Is there's a segment of born-again Christians who live differently. And you know who it is? It's the born-again Christians with a biblical worldview. See how powerful that is? That if we want to change in some ways people in the church actually live, it's helping them to see all of reality from a biblical perspective. That's the power of ideas and the power of Christianity. David Kinnaman, he said this, he said, people who have a biblical worldview are much more likely to act like Jesus because they see such things as people and crises differently than most people do. It's a danger. If we don't consciously train young people to see the world biblically, they will unconsciously accept the ideas of our culture. If we don't consciously train young people starting early to see the world and everything in it biblically, they will unconsciously accept the ideas of the world and the culture that we live in. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 10. He says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. In other words, there shouldn't be a Christian militia. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. So yes, as Christians, all of our job is to love people, of course. But Jesus came in grace And he came in truth. And that part of our job, especially with young people, is to destroy the false ideas about happiness, about God, about the meaning of life that sidetrack them and stand in the way of the knowledge 
of God. That's part of our job, I firmly believe, in our Christian culture. In fact, I would put it this way. I would say our job is to train young people to know that they know truth. Myself included, is to train young people to know that they know truth. Now, you might be thinking, Sean, why are you getting all philosophical on me? Isn't it enough to know truth? Absolutely not. The huge difference between knowing truth and knowing that we know truth. See, think about it. I give a test to my students. I'll have take students A and B, two students. One student will come in and will know the answer, but didn't study, so she doesn't know that she knows the answer and has a good chance of guessing wrong. And then another student comes in who knows the answer but studies and has the confidence that she knows the truth. She's far more likely to get it right. See, as Christians, it's not enough just to know the truth because I believe that courage and I believe that Christianity comes not only when we know the truth, but we know that we know it's true. You see the difference? I believe our churches are filled with people who know the truth. But how many of them do you think really know that they know the truth and can fulfill what Peter said? He said, sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. Always be prepared to give an answer or a reason for the hope that is within. Any of us can do that. Now, here's the problem, and here's the challenge. We live in a culture, and I mean we, secular culture, both countries is pervaded by this in the same way. We live in a culture that says, when it comes to religion and it comes to morality, there's no such thing as objective truth. Let me say this again. Christianity is a knowledge tradition. For example, I'll come back to that. Let me show you a verse. Do you know in the gospel, in 1 John, we have at least one out of every four verses we see the word know, such as knowledge, that we know we have eternal life. We know Jesus rose from the grave. We know these things to be true. Christianity, which word, I'm curious, which, which word do you think we use more as Christians? Faith or knowledge? How many say faith? Let me see your hands. How many say knowledge? Which word shows up more in the scriptures? Not even close. Knowledge does. In other words, Christianity is not just something we believe by blind faith, which is the way it's understood in our culture. It's not just something we blindly just kind of hope to be true without any evidence. It's actually something we know to be true. I know that two plus two equals four. I know that in my country, George Washington was the first president. And I know that Jesus rose from the dead. Christianity is a knowledge tradition. In 1 John, one in every four verses, we see the word know or knowledge or derivative such as know. So Christianity is not just a faith tradition. It's something we know to be true. But in our secular culture, the problem is, is that things of religion and things of morality are considered subjective things we believe in, but not things that we can know. Does that make sense? Let me say that again. Christianity is a knowledge tradition. We know certain things about God and the scriptures to be true. We know these things. But we live in a culture that says when it comes to religion, it comes to morality, there's no such thing as knowledge. There's just solely blind faith. So let me illustrate a couple examples for you. I do this with my students. Feel free to steal this if you want to. I took a huge jar of Starburst, which is one of my favorite candies, and I passed it around with my students, my high school students in a Christian school. And I, at first I said, if you can guess how many Starbursts are in this, I'll give you extra credit. You know what's amazing? Here's a little help for teachers. I learned that if you assign something and it's regular work, like half the students will do it. But if it's extra credit, they all do it. <laughs> so this year, all I've assigned is extra credit. <laughs> and the freshmen haven't even picked up on it yet. <laughs> Hence, that's why they're freshmen. I said, if you can tell me how many Starbursts are in this, then I will give you extra credit. So I passed around. Students are guessing 180, 221, 175. At the end, I stopped and I said, now, can we all agree before I tell you how many are in the jar that there is a right answer, an objective right answer, and a wrong answer? And they said, of course. I told them the right answer. None of them got it right. Then I passed the jar around again. I said, I want you to pull out the right flavor. Pull out your favorite flavor. So they pulled it out, and they're all, you mean high school seniors are getting giddy. They're like, ooh, we're eating candy in class, right? Isn't that kind of funny? 
It's like story time. My high school seniors actually want me to have story time with them. Like they did in kindergarten, I, beyond me. So I, I told them to pick out their flavor. And then I said, oh, I got a question for you. Can anybody tell me the right flavor? What's the correct flavor? And they looked at me like some of you are looking at me right now going, that's an odd question. Is there an objective right flavor of Starburst? No, there's a subjective preference. One, you can be true that red is the best if you like it, or true that yellow is the best if that's what you like it. It's a subjective thing. I said, so we have two categories here. One in which there's an objective right answer. The other one in which there's a subjective preference answer that can be true for you and not true for you. I said, now I got a question for you. In which category does morality go? Question? Is morality subjective preference? Or is it something in which there's objective truths? And guess what a lot of them said? It's subjective, it's preference. I said, in which category does religion go? And what did a lot of them say? Oh, oh, it's subjective. You might have your truth, Buddha. I have a different truth, Jesus. As if picking a religion or moral truths are subjective like picking ice cream flavor or a Starburst flavor. You see, Christianity makes objective claims about the world that we live in. But our secular culture says religion and morality are preference things no different than choosing ice cream. And it's seeped down through our churches, it's seeped down through our culture, and affects the way young people think about religion and their relationship with God. So I'll give you a couple examples. One is something our, our president the United States said recently. Listen to this, I think it illustrates it well. He said, I'm a Christian. And I believe in parents being able to provide children with religious instruction without interference from the state. But I also believe our schools are there to teach worldly knowledge and science. Can you notice a little distinction there? He says parents have the right to teach religion in the privacy of their home. But when it comes to public institutions, we are to teach worldly knowledge and science. So you see what faith is? Faith is privatized. It's personal. It's kept out of what we think is really true in the world in which we interact. And then he followed up and he said this. He said, I believe in evolution. And I believe there's a difference between science and faith. That doesn't make faith any less important than science. Do you think he really believes that? It just means they're two different things. So you, you see the worldview behind this? Oh, faith is important in the privacy of your home and with your kids. But when it comes to the public arena, what we really think is true, what we think is objective, what is noble that we can debate about, religion and morality are kept on the sidelines. So you see what happens? Our culture encourages us, whether we realize it or not, to compartmentalize our faith from what we really think is true compartmentalized into the privacy of my home, the privacy of my spiritual life, and the privacy of my personal relationship with Jesus, but it's not something we think is objectively true in the world that we live in. So I've seen studies, massive studies that ask this question. The last young people and college students, and this is actually they dealt internationally in this survey, they asked them the question, how important is faith to you? And this study said, said 67% said that faith is very or extremely important in their lives. Now, when people first see that, their response is, wow, this generation, faith is very important and it's central to them. But you guys know something obvious about statistics, which is what? You can get a very different response based upon how you ask the question. So in this study, they asked, one was at Harvard, they asked students all over, instead of when they first ask them how important is religion, they get a high percentage. But then in the study of youth and religion, they switch the question. Instead of asking young people first, how important is faith? They said, tell me what's most important in your life. You see how different of a question this is? And guess what the survey showed? Unbelievable. Christian Smith, the author of the survey, said what rarely arises in such conversations are teens' religious identities, beliefs, experiences, or practices. Religion does not normally seem to pair much on most teenagers' open-ended lists of what really matters in their lives. Religion seems to become rather compartmentalized or backgrounded in the lived experiences of most U.S. teenagers. And then he went on to say it's not just U.S. teenagers because of our global culture. 
He said it's becoming a worldwide phenomena because of our increasing secular culture. And then listen to what he said next. To me, it's like the lights went on when I read his next statement. He said this. He said, what a number of teens apparently mean in reporting that religion is very important in their lives is that religion is very important in the strictly religious sector of their lives. He said religion influences them religiously. That is when it comes to church, basic beliefs, prayer, and so on, but not necessarily in other ways. Do you see the power of this? So religion is important to me in the privatized sphere of my life. It gives me purpose. Oh, it gives me meaning. It affects me on Wednesday night at church or Sunday. But it doesn't translate into what I think is really true, what I think is objective about the world that I live in. Do you see the disconnect here? That's a result of our secular culture, I believe, affecting, starting to affect people globally, especially because of the Internet. Now, I'll give you a couple examples of this. Well, I'll give you a personal example. Kind of an embarrassing personal example. Recently, my wife and I bought a new car. It was a minivan. <laughs> Boy. When we first got married, I told my wife, I said, just so you know, you're not marrying a minivan guy. I won't drive one. I won't own one. One won't park in our driveway. I grew up with a minivan. I don't care what it costs. I don't care about insurance. Now, all of you are laughing because of not my naivete 10 years ago when I was first getting married. Gas prices go up. The economy tanks. You have kids who like to swing open doors like this and bang the neighbor cars, and the minivan has a door that opens up like this. I caved to the pressure and bought a minivan. But guess what? I don't care anymore. I get an amen from the males who drive a minivan. Come on. All right, good. I'm in good company. Well, I went to my students the next day, and I asked them this question. I said... My wife and I recently bought a car yesterday. I said, do you think in any way my Christian faith should influence the buying of a car? And they looked at me as if I said to them, hey, do you guys hear about this new technological breakthrough? It's called an iPod. Now, if you did that with a student, you would lose any credibility you had. It'd be gone. And a girl goes, she goes, Mr. McDowell, whatever. It's just a car. I know you get that line. I said, no, really. So my religious convictions don't in any way inform the buying of a car. And these are high school seniors who grew up in the church who had been through my class for a lot of that year. And I kept pressing them and pressing them. Finally, the girl goes, I know, Mr. McDowell. I know what you're looking for. I thought, good, enlighten us. She said, if the car dealership you were going to buy that car from was going to use the proceeds to fund abortions, then it would be immoral. <laughs> now, technically, is she right? Yes, but do you see the disconnect between how my worldview doesn't really affect the day-to-day -day decisions and way that we live? It's in these remote extreme examples, but doesn't translate down in my life. No sense that the money I spend, it's not really my money, it's God's money. And I'm a steward of his money. No sense, like Paul says, we are ambassadors of Christ. And whatever car I drive will send a message, whether I want it to or not. Look, this week, I, was, I did actually buy a new car on top of that. And there was this slick Mercedes that was so nice. And it was cheap. And personally, I don't care if someone else says, personally, I couldn't drive it because of the message it, it would send. That was just a personal conviction of mine. It will send a message to people. No sense that this car salesman, as sleazy as he might be, no offense to your car salesman. <clears throat> I usually pick on lawyers. In fact, you know when you speak, you're supposed to start off with kind of jokes to connect with the audience. I shared this story yesterday, if you were in my other seminar. You're supposed to connect and tell jokes. So I was picking on lawyers, comparing lawyers to jerks. And this guy sitting in the front was getting fuming mad. He was ticked. I could tell it. When I was done, I walked down the stairs. He came right up to me. He goes, I'm offended at what you said. I, well, I said, what did I say to offend you? He said, I can't believe you compare lawyers to jerks. I said, well, what are you, a lawyer? He goes, no, I'm a jerk. <laughs> My student had no sense that even this car salesman is made in the image of God. 
and has value simply because he's a member of the human race. It was a complete disconnect between that. You see, as if my worldview in no way informs the way I actually live. Look in this survey. They interviewed students all over. And look at the disconnect in the minds of these young people. They, asked, they just asked them a simple question. They said, can you tell me how your faith in God affects the way you live? And these answers, if they weren't so sad, are almost funny in the disconnect. Look at what one 18-year-old Christian girl said. She said, religion influences me a lot with the people I choose not to be around. I would not hang around with people that are, you know, devil worshipers. Because that's just not my thing. 17-year-old Catholic boy. He said, religion influences me in things I choose not to do, unlike bad things, like murder or something. <laughs> Did you see the disconnect? Oh, yeah, religion is important in this privatized sphere in my life, but it's not something I think is objective, not something I think is true. Look, if religion is all about something in my privatized life that makes me happy, then kids will give it up for the next thing that comes around that makes them more happy. See, listen to the statement that he said again. He said, the language that dominates adolescent interests in thinking, oh, I'm sorry, before that, he said, one of interviews almost never uncovered among teens was a view that religion summons people to embrace an obedience to truth, regardless of the personal consequences or rewards. Because religion is about subjectivity. It's not about truth. And then he said, what language that dominates adolescent interest in thinking about life, including religious and spiritual life, is primarily about personally feeling good and being happy. True? Isn't that what many of our churches preach? Come to Jesus and it'll fix your marriage. Come to Jesus, it will give you a good self-esteem. Come to Jesus because it will make you happy. As if God is a cosmic therapist who exists to make our lives better. If I read the Bible correctly, it seemed to me that people who actually follow Christ suffer more. Look at the prophets. Look at Mary called blessed among all women. She got to watch her son crucified. I couldn't imagine watching that with my son and considering myself blessed. You see, our secular culture says that Christianity is to be compartmentalized. And it's in the privacy of my life. But it's not something that's objectively true. It's not something that's objectively real that informs the way I really look at the way the world works. So I think one of the very reasons that young people are walking away from the faith, one of them, not the only one, one of the key reasons is they've been taught to compartmentalize their faith from what they really think is true. So when they get confronted with good reasons and good objections against the faith or something that makes them happier, then why hang on to it? What's the point? I know what some of you are thinking. Boy, when I get home, my kids are going to get it. <laughs> oh, I do. My kids must be irreversibly screwed up. Now, now, I know there's some young people in here, too. If you're thinking that, I've got a challenge for you. I've had that thought many times, and I read a book called Soul Searching by Christian Smith, who's now at Notre Dame. At the very end, he said... Before you blame young people for their behavior and their beliefs, he said, take an honest look in the mirror. He said, where do you think they get these ideas? We can blame our secular culture and the educational system and our politicians and the movies until we're blue in the face. But the bottom line is, all studies show that I've ever seen that the prime influence on a young person are the parents. And that's why scripture always, over and over again, says the responsibility lies within the parents. Now look, it doesn't mean we can control our kids. I've seen phenomenal parents and the kids choose to walk away. We can't control them. But there are things I think we can do to help young people and give them the best fighting chance to follow our Lord and Savior that we love so much. Let me give you three quick principles. And then this afternoon, we're going to look at a two particular worldview issues that I think will help you to make sense and see how some of the issues we look at are objectively true. And first place to start is simply with, with something Nancy Pierce said in her book, Total Truth. She said, we must begin by being utterly convinced that there is a biblical perspective on everything, not just spiritual matters. In other words, if we want to train young people in a biblical worldview, it begins with us. 
I think we can only pass on to the next generation what we have first learned and the depth that we have gone to in our own spiritual lives. we got to ask ourselves some honest questions, and I do this with myself all the time. Do I compartmentalize the way I live? Do I compartmentalize the way I believe about the world? And am I setting up my kids to do the same thing? There's a biblical perspective on everything. Do you really believe that? Do you believe there's a biblical perspective on everything? It begins by looking at ourselves. It actually says in Colossians 2.3, one of my favorite verses, that in Christ are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Christ are all, not some, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I'll give you an example. Biblically, what is a human being? A human being is a body and soul. We are a body and soul. That's what the Bible teaches. Jesus talks about don't fear somebody who can kill the body, but fear any time a God who can send one soul eternally to hell. We are body and soul. Now, in our deeply secular culture, what is a human being primarily viewed as? Just a body. You're just like a physical machine. That's why things like depression, what's the most common solution to depression? Simply a physical drug. If you're simply a physical thing, then the solution is physical. Look, if my car won't start in the morning, I don't sit there and I go, okay, I'm sorry for kicking you. Take a deep breath. Let's try to start you again. (laughs) It's a purely physical thing. It requires a physical solution. But a human being is body and soul. So sometimes things like depression can be driven on by chemical imbalances. I have no problem believing that. Look, I have low blood sugar. If, I don't, if my sugar gets low, I get really cranky, and I'm not fun to be around. I'll admit it. Sometimes I'm talking to my wife. She says, have some cheese and some milk, and then we'll finish this conversation. <laughs> it's true, because my body affects my soul. But on the other hand, when it comes to dealing with depression, some of the most successful therapy deal is called cognitive therapy, that our ideas about the world in our mind shapes our experience. So a truly healthy person will have a healthy body. You need sleep. You need to eat right. You need to exercise. You need to laugh at times. But also take care of the soul in relationships and right beliefs and in prayer, etc. So health can be seen through a biblical perspective. That's why when young people, I talked about our hooking up culture, which says what? In fact, 91% of college students recently said hooking up is popular on the college campus. And the idea of a hookup is you can just go and have sex with somebody for one night and then move on your way the next day. As if you can just give somebody your body and then move on as if it doesn't affect you. But why is it, and I ask young girls this, why is it the next morning you wake up and so often, if not always, feel lonely and hurt and abused? Because what you do with your body affects your soul. You see, think about science. We could debate the question of creation and evolution. In fact, tomorrow morning, I'm doing a session on intelligent design. And I think the case for an intelligent creator is, is powerful. And it's incredible enough to give you goosebumps. But there's a more basic question a lot of people don't even explore. Why is it that of all the cultures in the world, that the scientific enterprise grew up most deeply in a culture shaped by a biblical worldview. That's not an accident. Now, you take God out of the picture. What's the reigning principles in the universe? Chance, randomlessness, and purposelessness. So if you're the result of a purposeless, blind process, then how do you know you can, can even trust the conclusions that your brain tells you? Ever thought about that? Listen to something Charles Darwin said. He said, the horrid doubt always arises whether the conviction of man's mind, which has developed from the mind of lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust the conviction of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? You see what he's saying? He's saying, if my theory is true, I have no basis for trusting my own conclusions that my theory is true. That's a pretty big problem. That's why atheists can be scientists. Of course they can. But they have to borrow from the Christian worldview in order to do science. Now, why does science fit within a Christian worldview? 
because we believe God is the Logos. It says in Isaiah, come let us reason together. And the world is orderly, and there's cause and effect, and we're made in God's image to understand the world, and we've been given a reason to study it. That's why the great scientists from Pascal and Newton and Boyle and Kepler and Copernicus either were Christians or believers in God. So science itself can't even get off the ground without a Christian worldview or one awfully like it. Do you see how this works? When we start to see the evidence for creation and think about even science from a biblical perspective, you know what I found? It's harder for young people to just compartmentalize their faith of something that just makes me feel good and gives me purpose. It's something that's actually true. And this is real. Take the issue of government. In my country, our framers came up with three branches of government. Why? Because you know what our country's believed? That man is not basically good. That power corrupts. So we spread power out. And I'm not saying it always works. But in principle, that's their idea. Why did communism and Marxism utterly fail? Because they have misdiagnosed the nature of man. They thought human beings were naturally good. And that all problems come from external differences in the environment. And as John Lennon's song about Imagine says, if we can just make all possessions equal, we can have a perfectly just and happy society. But the problem is, Jesus said, greed comes from the heart. It comes from within. So even the issue of government can be looked at from a biblical perspective. The place to begin is to see that there's a biblical perspective on everything. Now, let me give you one more, and then we'll wrap up. The set, well, the second principle, very quickly, fundamental basis of any Christian worldview is creation. It's creation. Why? Think about it. The first thing we learn about God in the Bible is that God created the world. And then there was sin, which messed things up. And then we have redemption, which fixes things. Now, what that means is... In the first few chapters of Genesis, we learn that certain things are good. Sex is good. It's beautiful. But it's been perverted by sin. Work is good. It's beautiful. But it's been perverted by sin and workaholics. Language, relationships, families are all good, but they've been affected by sin. So I often have a discussion with my students. I'll say, why do you think a human being should even have any value at all? And the answer is, because a human being is made what? In the image of God. We have infinite dignity and value and worth. And I'll say now, how has our culture twisted that truth and changed where our value comes from? Oh, it's about what you accomplish. It's about what you look like. It's about what car you drive. It's about how much money you have. Now, how do we get back to a biblical perspective? By understanding our value. Take sexuality. Sex is beautiful. How has it been perverted in our culture? Well, women are objects. And etc. You know all the different ways that it's been perverted. How do we get back to God's perspective? You see how that works? Is that from a biblical perspective, it begins with understanding the world is designed and God has a purpose for the way we live. It's been perverted by sin. That's where pain and destruction comes in. And then how do we get back to a biblical perspective? You can do that with everything. And if you want to see some of the evidence, my session tomorrow morning is going to be a lot of fun. It really gives me goosebumps when I look at some of the scientific evidence. The last one I would simply say, these are just principles for you. I'll just tell you this one is simply have worldview conversations with young people. I'm convinced that this generation is a conversational generation. They want to talk. They want to listen. They're open to people who have discussions to them about the faith. 50 years ago, I saw a study that blew me away. They said three things shaped the worldview of a young person. Two of them are relevant for us. One, they said, was the pictures that were put up in the home shaped what the young person thought was valuable in the way they look at life. You know the second one? The second one was conversations with adults over the dinner table. They said, that's it. Not lectures, but simple conversations where stories are told, where values are shared, where conflict is worked out. He said, in the context of a relationship, worldviews are often shared. And I think that's right. That's why Jesus broke bread with people and he built relationships. Now, what do we do? We have the TV on. We crowd out that dinner time and we don't make it a value. 
Do you build relationships with your kids? Now, if you do this, I want to brace you for something. Prepare yourself ahead of time not to respond like, I can't believe you believe that. I was asking my students a while ago, I said, hey, how many of you think that uh, at a Christian school, people should move in together and get to know each other first, see if they're compatible before they get married? Half my students shot their hands up. It surprised me and it took me off guard. Now, instead of going, what? I can't believe that. I said, well, that's interesting. I said, what would make you think that? I said, well, let's look at the other side of their reasons for concern. And I closed it by saying, why do you think studies show that people who live together first are between 40 and 60% more likely to get divorced? Why do you think that's the case? And in conversation, when you've built a relationship with somebody, we have the right to talk about worldview things. I remember being as a kid, my dad took me to see, and you judge what movies your kids can see. He took me in high school to see Schindler's List, which is a Steven Spielberg movie about... Uh, the Holocaust, very realistic. And afterwards, he goes, son, do you think the Holocaust is wrong? I said, of course they kill people. He said, well, why is killing wrong? He said, well, it's in the Bible. He said, well, why does the Bible say it's wrong? And I stopped and I said, I have no clue. Is it wrong just because the Bible says it? No. The Bible says it because it's wrong. Killing is wrong because God's character is life. Because of God's nature as revealed in the scriptures. He used that movie as an example to teach me truths about life. And that's why in something called the College Transition Project, they asked, they were studying young people transition into college, and they said, what can adults, parents do to effectively transition people over? And then came back and they said, you know what we found? We said the most significant thing they can do is build a relationship with young people and have meaningful, significant worldview conversations about life. Isn't it powerful? That in the context of a relationship, we can help train young people to think biblically. Now, I've got to wrap up because of time. I, there are a whole bunch of books. I guess I'll just show you real fast because I always get asked, are there resources, are there books? My website is seanmcdowell.org, and all my books are listed on that. And by the way, I have a recent upcoming debate with an atheist that you can actually watch live. On the top of my website, it says my upcoming debate. You can watch it live if you want to. But more importantly, would you pray for me? Very outspoken critic of Christianity, my first debate. And hopefully I'll have a better voice. And you feel free to watch that live. Very interesting. But on there, I have articles. I have a blog. I have some books listed just done as resources to help you. Here they have a few. I'm going to talk about this afternoon. Our next session is on why can we even trust the Bible? Look, the basis for the Christian worldview always stems back to the scriptures. How do we know it's true? And I wrote a couple books with my dad. I updated his book, More Than a Carpenter, and then Evidence for the Resurrection is about the historical reliability and how we know it's true and we can trust these things. It is not just subjective. And then a book, Ethics, I wrote for young people, which was all dealing with issues like abortion, homosexuality, truth, the meaning of life, written in a way young people can get. And I've had a lot of parents actually take their kids through it together in the context of a relationship, and it just opened up a lot of things to talk about. And then a book on intelligent design I'll be talking about tomorrow, really taking some of the scientific breakthroughs and just putting them down on the, to the non-specialist. And I'll tell you, if you haven't studied this, every Christian should know with confidence the case for God in the natural world. It's unbelievable. 3,000 years ago when David said, the skies proclaim the glory of God, day by day they spew forth speech and knowledge, he actually meant it. He actually meant it. I think within the past 10 to 20 years, that verse has been shown to be demonstrably true. And then another book, more on the line of worldviews, is called Apologetics for New Generation. How do we actually do apologetics? And how do we do worldview in our increasingly secular culture? And I think they have that over the book fair, if that helps you out. Well, thank you for bearing with me with this frog in my throat. You guys are a phenomenal audience. Hope giving you some things to think about. What time are we starting back? Can someone tell me definitively after lunch? 1.30, we're going to talk about the reliability of scriptures, and you won't want to miss the powerful case that we can have that the Bible is really true. Thank you, Sean. What an important session that was for our youth as well as ourselves. If you'd like to learn more about Sean McDowell, his speaking events, his resources, and his podcast, please go to seanmcdowell.org. Thank you again for listening. 
We're adding more and more to this free online library of great sessions all the time. So remember to check back to see all the new content. Once again, Elsa and I invite you to head on over to BreakforthMinistries.com. That's BreakforthMinistries.com. When you're there, you'll learn about our live Breakforth events, Breakforth Holy Land tours, and so much more. And while you're there, if you feel like you'd like to help out with the cost of putting Breakforth Online out to the world for free, you can choose to support the ministry there as well. But don't feel pressure. Even $5 helps us to keep expanding this free library to the world. Okay, we'll catch you again for more sessions at Breakforth Online.